Welcome to State of the State. I'm Darlene DeRezzo and I'm in conversation with Dana Kopak. Dana is the technical assistant with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management Division of Fish and Wildlife. Welcome. Thank you for having me tonight. We are so excited to have you here and to share your aquatics research education program and your hunter education program, correct? That's correct. Okay, we are curious, what brought you to DEM? Tell us about that path. I took a less traditional route in. So most people come in either by being an intern or a volunteer. I did happen to be a volunteer. Um, I started out by attending uh, some of the free fly tying classes uh, for fly fishing that were offered throughout the state at libraries. And I realized that I really liked the activity. Basically, you're making your own fly. Um, and it was very creative mm -hmm. and um, I decided to take it a step further and join a club and get really proficient at it. And once I did, I started um, teaching at different libraries in the northern part of the state. And then a position opened, and because I was such a dedicated volunteer, um, I was able to get that position. So position opened up at DEM? That's correct, in the education office at the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Now, did you fish? Um, I did dabble in fishing mm -hmm. uh, when I was much younger, and then I started again once I decided to attend those fly tying classes. Um, I really got into fly fishing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so from there, how did your role expand? Um, well, the role I'm in currently is half aquatic resource education, which is fishing and clamming and aquaculture, and the other half of it is hunter education. So I also had a background in shooting. Um, I was a situate police explorer, which is a program for youth age 14 to 21 to career the uh, to explore the career of law enforcement. And so I had a lot of uh, formal firearms training there. Okay, did you think you were gonna go into law enforcement? I did, okay. I did. And then? Injury prevented me from doing that okay. and I took a different path. You did, okay, yeah. so this is your passion now. Yes, it is. Okay, so where would you like to start? Which program? Um, Hunter Education. Sure. Uh, so, okay, I teach um, a formal curriculum course. Uh, hunter education is required anytime you want to hunt um, in the state of Rhode Island using firearms. And there's also a bow hunter education course, which is required if you want to hunt with archery equipment. So I teach both of those, um, as well as a bunch of advanced courses like wilderness first aid, land navigation, tree stands, ground blinds, anything related to hunting, any skills that you might need to be a successful and responsible and ethical hunter. Um, so I recently realized though that there are uh, dwindling numbers for females in hunting. And so I've kind of taken a head-on approach to try to solve that. Okay, well why do you think that is? Um, well, we have a new R3 coordinator. Mm -hmm. R3 stands for Recruit, Retain, and Reactivate. It's his job to run statistics and find out where things are lacking mm -hmm. and to try to get more people interested in hunting. Um, and, and particularly women. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so tell us about the statistics and why you think there's a drop off of women hunting. So I do have some alarming statistics. Okay. There are approximately 5,000 licensed hunters in the state of Rhode Island currently. 200 are female. Oh, wow. So yeah, that's quite alarming. Um, and we had, uh, in 2018, 49 females took the hunter education course, which is a, approximately a 10 hour course. Mm -hmm. It's a mix of lecture and hands-on. And um, then in 2022, only four of them were still licensed. Wow. So we had a huge drop off. And our main age category that we're aiming towards to kind of bring them into the sport and follow them throughout their lives is 12 to 35 years old. Okay. Zero of those are still licensed from that 2018 class. Hmm. Um, all four of them came from 36 years or older. 
Why do you think that is? So do you have the information on, do you think women are intimidated or yes. they maybe don't have the camaraderie of other women? That too. There, okay. there are many barriers to mm -hmm. women in hunting and fishing as well and uh, they're very similar. So one of the barriers is you know, if you're a guy and obviously there's 5,000 licensed hunters in the state, um, so 200 of them are women, so 4,800 males, you have a pretty good pool of buddies that you can ask to go hunting with you. Mm -hmm. Females, if you want to go with another female, not so much. Um, so access to a mentor as well. If you are new to hunting, you don't just want to go out into the woods and try to figure it out on your own. You need somebody experienced mm -hmm. um, so that you are responsible and are successful. Um, women are often underrepresented in the market as far as like hunting clothing. I was going to say cute clothes. Yeah, simple as that. Um, you know, the, there are probably very small sections in the store of the female hunting clothing and the male section is just much larger. Mm -hmm. However, there are some um, companies that are female hunting brands strictly, um, so that's good. Um, lack of access to outdoor skills is another barrier. What so, does that mean? Well, growing up, um, you know, a lot of the male were in Boy Scouts and everything, and they learned a lot of these essential outdoor skills, whereas the females, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, that's changing, I think. Um, Scouts is kind of open to everyone now, and um, hopefully they're getting those skills. Yeah, so, so t tell me what would be three skills, three outdoor skills that we might need to go hunting? Um, firearm safety, oh, mm -hmm. number one. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about the safety. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, map and compass skills. Can you use a map, a topographic map, and a compass to navigate your way around? You don't want to rely on GPS and cell phones and electronics because oftentimes um, they can fail out in the wilderness. And uh, another one would be, I don't know, um, tree stands. Tree stands are heavy, they're cumbersome. Um, you have to be able to set them up, you have to be able to climb them, mm -hmm. and, uh, ascend and descend them. And um, hunters, the number one cause of injury is falls from a tree stand, especially when the hunter is climbing up or down. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's not something you're used to, it can be kind of intimidating. Yeah, so would you need agility and strength? You definitely would. To go up and would. down a tree, okay. Absolutely, there are some tree stands, like the climbing tree stand, where you're essentially um, doing a reverse crunch and inchworming your way up the tree. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of uh, core strength. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. You're educating women then yes. on firearm safety, um, topography, I got that right, and um, yeah, how to climb up and down a tree. <laughs> and you had an inaugural women's class, or was, the, yeah. was this an inaugural? It first? was an okay. inaugural uh, women's hunter ed class. So, um, How many women did you have in that class? I had 22 in that class, okay. which it, that's a pretty good number. Um, we've been having kind of low numbers in hunter ed, mm -hmm. so 22 is not bad for us, and to have it filled with all females, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty great. Um, so I wanted to take the intimidation factor of having males in the class out, um, because that is just one of the barriers, mm -hmm. and um, I think it went really well. Everybody passed. Everyone learned something. Um, we had pretty good reviews. Uh, we mixed a lot of hands-on with lecture. So, you know, we were handing people training firearms. The pins are removed, they're not able to fire, so it's safe. And um, we had training ammunition, and we wanted people to get hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. You'll follow these women then to see if they renew their license? Usually we don't, but okay. this time we definitely are. Um, we have a list of who was in the class. We want to see who purchased a license. We, we want to see, um, like longitudinally, if they continue to purchase the license. Um, we're working on creating some sort of social media network for them to all join so that they can keep in communication mm -hmm. and maybe go hunting with each other or shooting even. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, what else do you wanna say about Hunter Ed? Um, I think I'd like you to touch on responsibility, ethics, conservation, maybe educate our viewers about why hunt. 
Okay, yeah, well, that's excellent. Thank you for that lead in. Um, so basically hunters and target shooters are the number one financial contributors to conservation. And that's because they're putting money into a federal grant called the Pittman-Robertson Act and that is funded by an excise tax of 11% anytime you purchase a firearm, ammunition, archery equipment. Um, and also hunters are purchasing licenses, tags, permits, and that all goes back into education and um, wildlife conservation, research, and land management. It's all really important. So they're the core funders of these elements. Um, and we really take responsibility and ethics seriously. Um, we never want people going out there just to take a shot and injure an animal and, oh, well, maybe I hit it, maybe I didn't, I'm not sure. No, that's not acceptable. You should go for a quick, clean kill at all times. We never want any animal to suffer. We hunt for the main purpose of food. Mm -hmm. um, there's a thing called wanton waste that we're trying to avoid. We never want to take something's life and just waste it. We, we have reasons why we're taking this life and we're going to use it to the fullest. Mm -hmm. um, and responsible hunters are good shooters. Um, they have to practice, they have to know their effective range to be safe. And that effective range could be different than the firearms effective range. So some firearms can shoot a mile, two miles away, but that doesn't mean that I'm accurate at those distances. So I need to go to the range and practice so that I don't fire at game and take a lousy shot and hurt that animal. Mm -hmm. What happens if we don't have enough hunters out there? What happens to the deer population, coyote population, turkey population, duck population? Correct. So as hunters, we are hunting the surplus population only. So for example, if um, in the state of Rhode Island, this is just an example, we can uh, safely support 1,000 white-tailed deer annually based on habitats and resources such as food, water, space, and shelter. Um, and we have 1,500 deer this year. The biologists went out and noticed that we had a surplus of 500. The hunters will be allowed to hunt that extra 500 because when the population swell, what happens is the resources dwindle and the animals are going to die of starvation, disease, um, and it's, it's gonna be very unpleasant. So um, we hunt just the surplus. Okay, and when is hunting season? There are many different hunting seasons. Okay. Um, so mainly in the fall, you're going to have an archery season and then that's going to turn into muzzleloader season. Oh, and tell our viewers what a muzzleloader is, what's that? Uh, a muzzleloader is more of a traditional type of hunting equipment where you're actually building your own projectile, if you will, and you're loading it through the muzzle end, which is the end of the barrel of the firearm where the projectile leaves. You're loading it through there and then you're placing um, another piece um, further down the firearm called a primer and when the firearm goes off when you pull the trigger that primer causes a spark which ignites the gunpowder and causes expanding gases to push the projectile out of the barrel. Um, it's uh, more of a challenge because every time you shoot it you have to stop and clean the barrel because it has a lot of corrosive material. It uses black powder. Mm -hmm. um, but the great thing about muzzle loaders is you have an extended season as compared to shotguns. And why is that? Um, I don't know. Okay, so, um, so archery se season is the first of the hunting season, I got that right? Okay, then muzzle loader, then? Then shotgun. Okay. Um, so basically shotgun has the smallest seed, the shortest season. Um, and those are the only three methods of take you can use in the state of Rhode Island is archery, muzzle loader, or shotgun. Okay, and then when does that season begin? When did, is it fall? The, yeah, fall. Okay. I 
don't know the exact date. Okay, but our viewers can go online and get that information. Absolutely, right. you can look up the Rhode Island Hunting and Trapping Regulations Guide and it will have that information in it. Okay, what else do you want to say about the Hunter's Ed program? Um, basically that it's for um, all ages, mm -hmm. but you can't obtain a hunting license until you're at least 12 years old. Um, so that's important to know. Mm -hmm. And most of our advanced courses, we'd like you to be 10 years or older just because of some of the things that you're handling can be kind of heavy. There can sometimes be a lot of hiking, especially in the land navigation course. We could cover several miles in rough terrain off trail in just one day. Wow. And you mentioned that hunters should practice. You have a range, right? The Department of Environmental Management runs a range? Yes, we do. So we have a range and it's free. It's open April through October. It's called the Great Swamp Shooting Range and it's in West Kingston at the Great Swamp Management Area. Um, there is a, an application to obtain a permit. All you have to do is fill it out, get it notarized, and then you'll get um, a permit after attending a safety briefing, and that permit is good for five years. Our range has a 50-yard area, a 100-yard shooting area, trap with um, brand new, two brand new launchers that have wobble features, and archery as well. Archery, you don't need a permit but for the firearms, you do. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, anything else before we move on to your aquatics resource education program? Just really quick, we yeah. have a couple of really great youth programs as well. We have okay. youth waterfowl in October and youth turkey hunting in the spring, and um, we accept 10 youths per program. Um, it's pretty competitive. You have to write an essay and everything to get in, but it's a wonderful experience where they go out with mentors and learn everything they can. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so do you have the dates? Do you want to share the dates with the viewers? I don't have dates. That's okay. We can put them up at the end of the show, um, also on social media. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to the next program, which is your aquatics resource education program. Okay, so the ARE for short, that's a, another wonderful program. Um, so we cover saltwater fishing, freshwater fishing, um, spin cast and spinning with the bale that you flip um, as opposed to like a closed reel. And we also cover fly fishing and again, fly tying. We have clamming classes and we also have a really great school program called Salmon in the Classroom and Trout in the Classroom where teachers can sign up and we'll provide them with tanks and either salmon or trout eggs and they'll raise them in the classroom. You're kidding. Oh, it's really wow. neat. The kids really enjoy I seeing bet they do. That's the life amazing. cycle. Yeah. And um, then in, later on a few weeks after they've had the eggs and they hatch and they turn into fry, they go on field trips to release them in different bodies of water throughout the state. And then you can fish in those bodies of water, correct? Or uh, Yes. Wow. Okay, so yep. what about the ratio of men to women fishing and clamming? I don't have those statistics. Okay. Um, but I can say that the male population with fishing is still much higher than the female, mm -hmm. and females still encounter very similar barriers as they do with hunting. Okay. What about clamming? What do we need to know about clamming? Clamming is really fun. We have um, Jody King. Um, he's a commercial clammer in Rhode Island. He teaches those classes. Um, and they're offered six times a year in the warmer summer months, so we're not, you know, freezing in the ocean water. water. Mm -hmm. um, we go to usually a beach, um, and we teach everybody how to use the rakes and how to clam and, and dig for those quahogs. We're, we're targeting quahogs in those classes. And anything that the staff catches, because we all go out too, and we bring groups and kind of help them along. Mm -hmm. We bring what we collect back to the beach and we cook it um, with some spices and, and serve it up with Italian bread to all of the participants. And then whatever quahogs the participants catch, they can bring home and we send them home with a recipe and everything. So that is a lot of fun. That sounds like so much fun. What beaches are you at? Um, well, we're at North Kingstown Town Beach, okay. Colt State Park, Rocky Point, and I may be forgetting one. That's pretty much all of them, mm -hmm. but I can't tell you where because those are secret spots. Oh, they're secret spots. Okay. So <laughs> we'll watch for that. 
people can get on your email list, right, to be notified of yes. when those classes are being offered. Okay. What else? What about the fishing? You take people out on boats? Um, we offer a lot. So okay. uh, we do have um, a grant funded program called Vamos a Pascar, which is Take Me Fishing, and that is for the Spanish speaking population. We have translators and everything, and there are many different events throughout the summer. We have Cops and Bobbers, where we go to. What is it? Cops and Bobbers. Oh, what is that? <laughs> yeah, we go to Roger Williams Park usually. We team up with Providence Parks mm -hmm. and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Providence Police Department. Mm -hmm. And the law enforcement comes down, including the um, DEM, Environmental Police, and they help everybody fish. These are beginners usually. Mm -hmm. um, and then another event, we bring them clamming mm -hmm. um, at Rocky Point State Beach and um, also saltwater fishing off of the pier there. There's a, a new fishing pier, which is lovely. And then um, we have a saltwater charter in August where we go off coast and we deep sea fish and that's a lot of fun. And what are you fishing for when you're out there deep sea fishing? Oh, all different sort of fish. It, there, we're not like targeting a certain species or anything. Okay. It's whatever you can catch pretty okay. much. And that's all for beginners? That's you all don't for need any experience? Uh, no. Nope. And you provide the rods and... We provide yeah. all of the training and all of the equipment and the bait, everything that you would need. Mm -hmm. um, we also have just general public programs. Um, so anytime I have a fly tying class at a library, I bring them fishing um, to the Carolina Trout Hatchery in Richmond, which is the DEM's private stock pond, mm -hmm. and they get to test out the flies that they created. Um, and then randomly throughout the year, we have um, freshwater and saltwater fishing programs as well. Okay, and when are those offered? Do you know off the top of your head? or It, it, it varies okay. from um, month to month, year to year. Okay, uh, what else do you have? We're down to about five minutes. So okay. what else, yeah, what else do you want to share in five minutes, Dana? Okay, so we also have a great program for teachers throughout the state of Rhode Island. Um, we have Project Wet and Project Wild. Project Wet is uh, water education of today, and Project Wild concentrates on conservation and wildlife. And it's something where we train the trainer, so the teachers are the trainers. Oh. They'll come in and we'll provide education to them and the necessary textbooks and everything. And their lesson plans for the students, usually elementary through middle school, even high school, and um, their hands-on activities to learn about the wildlife, the conservation, and aquaculture in uh, a fun way. Okay. And also, as part of the ARE, Aquatic Resource Education Program, we also offer habitat assessments for schools. So this is a program where um, the students would come out on a field trip to different bodies of water, and we would provide them with little magnifying glasses and tweezers and buckets and all of this fun equipment, and they're gonna go collect insects out of the body of water that they're at, mm -hmm. and then try to identify what type of insect it is. We have charts and everything, and depending on what type of bug is present, some are tolerant to pollution, some are not tolerant to pollution. You're speaking water pollution? Exactly, okay. water pollution. And based on what insect you're finding, you can tell the quality of water. Wow. It's really neat. Um, and so there, we call those invertebrates. Those are the insects that you'd find. Oh. Um, that's really fascinating. The kids love it. It's a great science type of field trip. Mm -hmm. Sounds fascinating. Okay, so where can our viewers find the DEM and the Division of Fish and Wildlife on the internet and social media? We are on Instagram. You can look us up at RIDFW or just simply type in Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife. And we are also on Facebook and you can look us up by typing in Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife Outdoor Education. Um, and of course our website, just search Hunter Education or Aquatic Resource Education to see a listing of our current classes. All right, so down to a couple of minutes. Anything else that you wanna share with viewers? Do you wanna speak into the camera and share your passion, why we need to get maybe more women involved, why we need to conserve? 
Well, um, I will say that 5,000 total hunters for the entire state of Rhode Island is really low. And, um, you know, we, we need more people helping with that conservation um, so we have less car strikes and less damage to certain habitats and everything. Um, and nobody should be intimidated. Nobody should feel like they can't come to our classes. It's open for everybody and um, we're there to help and provide all the equipment and education you would possibly need. You know, what would be an ideal number? So you're saying 5,000 hunters, registered hunters, is too small of a number for our state. What, what would you like to say? Um, I don't know about a specific number of license holders, um, but I would say that we want to see less um, animals being hit by vehicles. We want to see less overpopulation of those animals, um, less gardens being destroyed and mm -hmm. everything. Um, so that would, we'd be looking at numbers of the game species. No, but as far as hunters go, if you want to see that number rise from 5,000 to, you, you, we don't know. We don't, have we don't a, know. We don't know. Okay. We don't know, but higher than it is. Okay. And you tag animals in your division, correct? That's correct. So every time you you take a shot, the first thing you want to do after finding the animal and mm -hmm. confirming its deceased is to tag it. Okay. And hunters purchase the tags through your department as well? That's correct. Online. Okay. And online they can go and apply for the license now? That's correct. That's a hunting license and a fishing license? Yes. They can get their tags online? Yep. Um, anything else that your website services? Um, I think uh, also boating registration and everything. Um, so that's rio, R-I-O dot R-I mm -hmm. dot G-O-V. And the R-I-O stands for Rhode Island Outdoors. Rhode Island Outdoors. And that's the licensing system. That's the licensing system correct, connected to the Department of Environmental Management, Division of Fish and Wildlife. That's correct. And so once you have a hunting license or a bow hunting license, it does not need to be renewed. You can certainly sign up and do a renewal on your own, but mm -hmm. it's not a requirement. All right. All right. So thanks again, Dana, for coming Thank you. and sharing your programs. We'll have information on our website and social media. You can get in touch with Dana. I'm Darlene Derezzo. Please find us on social media. We are at State of the State RI. That's on Instagram. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks.